Hi, it's Anna with Fully Thriving. Here I am with Dr. Finlayson. Fin That's right. There you go. Right. <laughs> Back with your name. Right. <laughs> yes. She is a licensed cl clinical professional counselor. She did her dissertation on LDS women's sexuality and relationship to desire. She works primarily with couples and individuals both in the office and online. Not only that, she hosts retreats and has an online class. Welcome. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Is that a class or classes? Cl at classes. I do a two courses for couples on strengthening their relationship and then another class on enhancing your sexual relationship. And then I do a class on women's desire, which is really about women's self and sexual development. And then uh, how to talk to your kids about sex course. Yeah. There's all kinds of <laughs> there. That's wonderful. Yeah. Yeah, so I was hoping to touch base on some hot topics on the sexual relationship within marriage. So, sure. yeah, so what would you say are attitudes or actions that are most needed to have a, a fulfilling marriage, sexually speaking? Well, th th this is the way I think about it is that, you know, sexuality is just a part of being human. And um, a lot of times we tend to think of sex as a corrosive force in a sense, in a way on, on human behavior. But I think sexuality just is a function of being human. And so the way that you are sexual has everything to do with who you are as a person. So what happens in your sexual relationship is often a kind of window into what's happening in the larger relationship because it's happening in both places. And so when people feel, I'm sort of going through the back door to your question, but when people feel that sex is about using or being used, when they feel like it's about obligation or managing someone's sense of self, when they feel it's about, you know, um, boredom or sort of de-eroticizing their partner, all of those things have a lot to do with not liking sex in marriage. <laughs> And when sex in marriage is positive, it has a lot to do with um, using your sexuality to love and be loved mm. and choose your partner as a separate person from you, not somebody that, you know, owes you sex or is obligated to you, but somebody that you choose and have been chosen by. And so it's an expression of um, intimacy and autonomy at the same time when sex is really good. And I know that's sort of high level. Yeah, that is the meaning frame in my experience that captures good intimate um, sex in long term relationships is there's a sense of both trust and familiarity, but a sense of autonomy and separateness and difference that function together um, and make marital sex like the best sex you can have when you've got that. Yeah, that makes so much sense. As you were talking, I was thinking about this idea of obligation versus you know, giving yourself and this separateness. And so talking about that, that that's, uh, brings a lot of clarity to I imagine what can be a big hindrance to a lot of couples. Yes. And, you know, I work with people that are religious often. And so there's often been a framing for many of us who've grown up in religious traditions that women, if they're good women, you know, they are dutiful to their husband's sexuality. And so the framing of sex is really around the husband and his sexuality, but it really sets it squarely in this duty frame, which kills passion, creates resentment on both sides. And uh, I don't think of it so much as um, giving your sexuality as it is about sharing mm. and being with through your sexuality. So it's intimacy in the true sense of being together going somewhere together, you know, in your sexual ex repertoire. And it's a way of experiencing and knowing each other deeply when it's really good. Yeah, I love that. I love that. So then how does body image impact the way a couple approaches the relationship? Well, sure. I mean, I think it comes down to this question of our desirability. And, you know, we all want to be desired in sex. That's why it's really painful for people if they feel like they, they want their spouse, but their spouse doesn't want them. Mm -hmm. And oftentimes it gets sort of focused around sex, but really it's an issue of, do you desire me? Mm -hmm. And, uh, and one of the, and so that's important, I think in good sex to feel desired, but one of the ways that we've 
um, framed sexuality for women is not so much around their desire, but their desirability. And so we've kind of falsely made this division culturally between men and women that men desire and women are desired. Mm. And if you're going to be desirable as a woman, you need to be attractive and physically appealing at all times. And we have these very, you know, it's one thing to say being desirable matters because I think it does matter on some level. And I could say more about that if you want me to, but to make it entirely around the physical and an unachievable ideal can be a real tyranny on the psyches of a lot of women who are paying attention to the messages that they're getting. Yeah. And so if you have imbibed that tyranny of demand and you hold that towards yourself, well, it can really wreak havoc on whether or not you feel sexual because it's the question of whether or not I think I'm desirable. And you may be partnered with someone who finds you very desirable, may find you very attractive, may bring a lens to your body that you don't because you're hypercritical, but it will impact desire because you don't feel worthy of the desire and um, acknowledgement that you're receiving. And so I think it's really important to challenge the ideas we've been given about what constitutes a desirable human being. Right. Because I think the more we link it to the superficial and to the things we can't control, and the worse it is for us. And the more we link it to character and to the aspects that we can control, right. um, the, the more we can stabilize our sense of self in the intimacy of sex. Right. Wow. When you mentioned that about the cultural bias, and the way that we view that lens, we view that men desire and women are the desirable. Yeah. Uh, I thought, gosh, I think that's been this unconscious belief of mine yeah. since I was as little as I yeah. have possibly been. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. This, so this is very much what I did my dissertation research on was this issue of how much we get programmed into being desirable and men in an agentic action oriented position and women in a receptive you know, passive position around the dance of sexuality. And, yeah. you know, the, there's nothing wrong with some of those aspects. They can be pleasurable, but, but when they're so rigid that right. they don't allow us to desire or right. for men to feel desirable. I mean, often right. men never get that feeling either. They feel like they always have to be the ones in pursuit and sticking their necks out yeah. and so on that we really yeah. handicap our understanding of good intimate relationships. Yeah, absolutely. So then um, you said to, you could say more about the need for desirability. I'd love to hear what you have to say. Well, I, what I would say is, you know, I think there's nothing wrong with feeling desirable, mm -hmm. um, especially when it's based in something healthy. Like if you, and I think the more you have self-respect, see what I see with a lot of the, <clears throat> the women that I work with um, who have been taught to be in a needless, wantless position, you know, they basically see themselves as um, often they kind of move into this idea that I shouldn't receive, that I shouldn't take in goodness because then it's selfish. And one of the best parts of good intimate sex is to say, I can see you desire me. And it makes sense that you desire me. <laughs> okay, like I feel desirable, yeah. not because I'm just so physically attractive, but because I'm a I am somebody that would make good sense to want to be close to. Mm -hmm. So uh, that is to say, when we have a healthy version of it, it allows us to receive the desire and the affection and the love and the nurturance that you can receive through a partner sexually and be able to receive it because you think it's a worthy choice and it's not, su it's not superficial. It's not superior. It's not arrogant. A lot of us think, well, either you're selfless or you're selfish. Right. I mean it more like, you know, I can see wh why you desire me because I'm a good person and I do good things in the world and I'm good to you and I'm a good partner and I have self-respect. And so it makes sense to me that you would desire me. That's just a really important part because if you don't have it, even if your spouse desires you, there's no landing place for that goodness. Yeah. Yeah. That, I appreciate you saying that if you don't have it. Yeah. A good landing place for your yeah. spouse. That's exactly. Really, that's really a lot of times we're trying to get our sense of self managed through getting other people to manage it for us, tell us we're good enough, make us feel wanted. But if we haven't developed 
that within ourselves, it, there is no a t a t place where it can attach. Yeah. It can't be taken in. Right. So that kind of leads me to the next question about what if there's one of the partners that have experienced sexual abuse? How do you navigate that and develop a healthy sexual relationship as a couple? Well, I think there's two pieces that are really important is one is that when you're in any kind of trauma, you know, the body has its own imprinting mm -hmm. in a sense. And so you may even rationally understand that you are now safe, that this is no longer the traumatic reality and that your mind may still be in reaction. You know, that's mm -hmm. the classic PTSD or the kind of trauma right. response of the body. And so I think that of any meaningful therapy deals with the body on some level because and deals with the irrational if that's the right way to say it the the more limbic response of the body because uh, not everybody is having ptsd responses in their sexual relationship even if they've come out of trauma but a lot of people are and so a good trauma therapy will help you deal with the mind's reactivity um, to be able to, to kind of keep your body from going into this regressive meaning frame that's very hard to work your way out of even when you sort of logically know it's not the old meanings. Yeah. But then the second piece is to this question of the meanings because depending on what the sexual trauma is, you know, the closer to home it is, and the more long standing it is, the more deeply negatively impactful it is. If it's sexual trauma from a stranger, a uh, one time event, I don't mean to minimize, but it has less impact than if it's a blood relation over a long period of time. Because um, not only is there less trauma over and over to the brain, but the closer to home it is, the more that one learns that relationships are ultimately exploitative, that the people that you trust mm -hmm. don't, aren't trustworthy. The people closest to you, you should be anxious of and afraid of. Mm -hmm. And you learn how to create meanings inside and outside of sex, or I should say a little differently. The way that you've learned to relate to yourself and to others is ultimately exploitative and not trustworthy. Sure. And so you may have both sexual trauma, but also a whole notion of how people basically relate is unsafe. Right. It's not good for you. Right. And so you're trying to get your body to operate in a place in which it's all the red flags are going off, either because of a historical response that doesn't match the current reality, or because it does match the current reality. So you have not just your historical response, but also that the relationship doesn't feel that it's about love mm -hmm. and about caring, that it does feel accurately that it's about a kind of exploitativeness that often still is happening in marriage, whether or not we like to talk about it that way. So it's, you know, so the ultimately you have to deal with your mind's reactivity, but then you have to look at what kinds of meanings you are actually participating in, in your marriage. You know, I was just working with a client just uh, earlier today who, who has a lot of this sense of the way that she and her husband have been married. There's been sexual abuse in their histories, but also the way that she and her husband have often related to one another is that she's afraid to let herself be knowable to him. Mm -hmm. And he doesn't really want to know her. So he gives signals to be dismissive of her, mm -hmm. to undermine how she thinks and feels. She handles it by feeling like men are basically pigs and exploitative, and she just is resentful and never wants to be sexual with him. And so I was talking to her today about the fact that, you know, her backing down keeps that dynamic alive. And she can't control whether or not her husband's going to deal with his part in being dismissive of her, but she can deal with if she's going to be dismissed. That is, rather than being quiet and resenting, standing up more and saying, I also want a good sexual relationship with you. I want good meaning sex. Mm -hmm. And when we can't handle the reality of our relationship or create more of a deep friendship, then it makes me not want to be close to you sexually. Mm -hmm. So it's like dealing with the larger relationship as a way of dealing with the meanings that are happening sexually and creating mm -hmm. something that has an entirely different meaning to it around sex than exploitation. Yes. Oh, thank you for sharing that. 
um, as I think about people say, maybe there's somebody that's, that's experienced the sexual abuse, they're trying to work through the sexual abuse. In general, they have a healthy relationship mm. in the moment they recognize I'm having a reaction. Mm -hmm. What should they do with your partner? What I would say is where you, you, what you want to see if you can do, and I think you know, in my courses I give people ways to get better at self-regulating when they're with one another. Um, and so if you're starting to go into a reaction, you know you're kind of losing your, your center. Um, and really couples that have learned to be collaborative, can communicate with each other in a way where they can still work together and stay together. Okay. Now, now I don't mean to say that. So what it might mean is I'm having a reaction. I'm going into my old place. I'm really sorry, but I can't move forward. Okay. That, that would be an honest, like, I can't do it. I don't want to be saying no to you right now, but I can't move forward and have this be a good experience and to be able to stay friends while you do that which is, you know, let's back off it. Maybe we can just lie next to each other. What, you know, is there some way we can just be with one another mm -hmm. that we can, that, you know, I, the person, you know, if you're the person that's coming out of the trauma, can regulate myself and just be with you and settle myself down and be with you. Um, because then maybe you can move forward again, or maybe not. But the, the question is not whether or not you get to intercourse or whatever, is whether right. or not you can stay together. Mm. in that process. And the more you have embodied experiences that are collaborative, the healthier it is for your brain. The more your brain learns that, okay, that it, it, it will rewire the brain faster yeah. than anything else is yeah. having embodied positive experiences. And if that positive experience is, is we backed off of something, we stayed connected, we mm -hmm. stayed friends, he didn't get upset and start pouting. You know, I was able to handle my sense of legitimacy, even though I was disappointed in my own response. Uh, sure. That the more your brain can kind of um, stabilize itself and learn how to self-regulate better in arousal or in those moments. Yeah. And so, yeah. 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 That whole concept of, you know, letting the old thought kind of atrophy the old. Uh, yeah. connection and building new neural pathways to yes. yourself to train to think differently. Yeah, that's right. That's yes. Perfect. So presuming there's no sexual abuse or anything in the, in the history, what do you do with unmatched desire in a marriage? Well, I would be looking at why is it unmatched? I, I don't know. I'm not pathologizing that. That's pretty normal. Just like you're going to have differences in desire for lots of things in any marriage, meaning you're, you're going to be different people and you're going to be different positions. And you may both be, you know, one may want low adventure, the other may want higher adventure, right? Mm -hmm. um, and there's those kinds of differences in couples too. But I would be looking at why? And I know that sounds pretty obvious, but sometimes it's not so obvious to figure out what is causing the low desire or the high desire. Um, what's creating, if it feels much more punctuated than it was when you first uh, became a partnership, what's been shifting that it's getting more and more punctuated? Because a lot of times what happens in f partnerships is one, maybe at first, you know, when you first fall in love, the validation of the other person's presence and their interest in you feels so good that it's easy to have desire. Mm -hmm. But then if you get married and then one person starts feeling like, hey, you know, it's been three days. Uh, when are we going to, you know, and it gets framed as, hey, you accommodate me. Well, then it starts to become for the lower desire person more about duty and managing the, the ego and the feelings of the other person. And then they start to feel more like often that they're getting pressured or that they're disappearing or that they're having sex to manage the other person's feeling about, feelings about themselves. And that makes sex less desirable. So their desire goes down even more which makes this person feel hungrier and like they can't get the feeling of passion, which makes it go up. So a lot of times there's a pattern happening that's like an artificial representation of their actual capacity for desire. So it, this person gets needier and more insistent, but is, is actually not really kind of how much they want of sex. It's more about, I want your sexual validation. 
what's the problem? <laughs> and this person's like, oh my gosh, I can't handle that. Every time I get in bed, I feel like there's this question about whether or not we're going to have sex. So it makes me not want it at all. And so then it gets really polarized and identifying the pattern. Um, because what's usually happening is people are trying to get their spouse to manage the questions around their own sense of self and their own sense of their desirability. And when you're using your spouse to get that question answered, it creates these sort of punctuated dynamics. And yeah. the more you can self-regulate, the more you're able to create something that it's easier to be both be with your spouse rather than trying to get something from them mm -hmm. or get them to stop bothering you. You can be with them more easily yeah. and feel at peace, you know, because, you know, we want to belong to our own sense of self and be close to people that matter to us. But when you feel like you can't be at peace with yourself and be with them because they want too much or they're trying to get their sense of self managed, then you'll tend to want to get away from them. And yep. so couples, um, often this is playing out in the dynamics of the sexual relationship, whether or not they can see it. Right. Well, I think that that's becoming so aware. I mean, this is so good to have this conversation because really what you're talking about are the nuts and bolts of relationship period right yes mm -hmm. but if we just like sex being this whole entity that's something different in our culture in our minds it's like this thing separate than relationship yes. so often and yes. then we forget that the same principles apply that's um, right as you're talking i'm thinking about couples that i've worked with where i've said you know let's think about the meaning what do you, what meaning are you making out of that behavior Let's, yes. let's evaluate whether that's true, right? Yeah, yeah. That's exactly what I'm hearing from you is that they're making meaning out of the lack of desire or the, the need for desire and, and those little communications that need to be clarified. Um, yes. Maybe he meant or she meant nothing by saying, hey, it's been three days. I mean, I, typically yeah, it's right. probably the man, but it came across a certain way and needs to be communicated. Yes. And maybe they did mean precisely that. Like, you know what I'm saying? Like maybe True. they did mean, Hey, like, what's your problem? You're, you know, I, I'm over here suffering for three days straight and why aren't you making me feel good? I thought that's what you as a good partner were going to do is make me feel good. I mean, that's often the implicit contract we have in marriage is you're supposed to make me feel good. So sometimes it is miscommunication and sometimes we are projecting our own anxieties onto our partner. But a lot of times we are tracking them accurately. That's the sure. harder news, actually. Yes. <laughs> that, you know, my spouse feels entitled to me sexually. Well, that nothing's going to kill desire faster than that, if that's the case, right? And so being able, but often we deceive ourselves from even recognizing the ways that we are pressuring or being immature or being withholding, that there are things that we don't want to actually see and look at. And so they kind of go underground but they still wreak havoc on desire and so sex is often the canary in the coal mine you know like they would take canaries down the coal mine to test i can't remember yeah. what kind of what the carbon dioxide levels i think and so uh and so it's sort of it's a way of testing what's the temperature of what's happening in the marriage often gets expressed in the sexual relationship that makes a lot of sense. I've always heard that, but the more we're talking, the more I'm going, that definitely rings true to yeah. me. Yeah. And so is it in these dynamics when they start creating this um, tension there or, or push-pull kind of thing that the struggle with pornography becomes an issue or is it something else entirely that brings pornography into the picture? Well, pornography, is, it's, a, it's a tricky topic because it, it is, uh, we often say it as like one thing and it, and it can mean so many different things based sure. on, on who the couple is and what's actually being looked at and all that kind of thing. But what I would say is that a lot of times we talk about pornography, just like we talk about sex, as if the pornography creates the problem mm. rather than the person viewing the pornography is expressing something about who they are and how they live right. right so what is it expressing that's what i want to look at because i'm trying to get a sense of what's happening within this person and within this partnership that this seems like a good solution and, and i'm not saying it is a good solution but it just right. is, it can look like to that person that this is the way of solving something for some people 
it's about the resentment. You know, I was talking to somebody today who was talking about like, I resented how dead our sexual relationship was, even though he was a big part of its deadness. Mm -hmm. And so then he would justify going and looking for aliveness mm -hmm. in pornography and deceiving his wife about that choice and, you know, resenting her, but not going and showing up more honestly. It was an easier move for him. I mean, she would do a similar thing in a different way, but I'd rather resent you and tell myself I'm the superior good one and then go be indulgent in my own way. Sure. And, um, and so a lot of people will use, will go to pornography that way. Some people actually have a good, I mean, like they have a willing sexual partner, but they don't want the exposure and the intimacy of a real partnership. And so they will actually turn down real sex and connection and the uncertainty of that. I mean, a lot of people, you know, I'm talking about men, even though women will turn to pornography too a lot, but, but men often have a lot of performance anxiety around sex. They're supposed to be the ones, you know, when we talked about desire versus desirability, they're supposed to be the sex machines all the time. They're supposed to always basically be competent and confident and don't get to really be human. And I think for a lot of men that that's high anxiety times or they're with a critical spouse. You know, and so they're looking for something that feels safer, less exposed, and it's a way to feel sexual without a lot of exposure. Um, you know, I think that it, it can be um, a way to have sexual feelings without having to really navigate the intimacy of a relationship. And I think that's harder for men and women you know, women may turn to pornography less, although they do, but they, they often can just shut the whole thing down as a way of getting away from the exposure of a real sexual relationship. Right. And so it really boils down to intimacy. Right. Yeah, your tolerance for intimacy, right? I mean, I think people can use things that will like, as a couple, they can turn to ideas or, or things like that that would maybe inspire their sexual feelings, but doing it collaboratively as a couple, like, you know, uh, they could read an erotic story together or do something like that. That's different because they're sort of like, okay, let's, let's come up with an idea that we find fun and, and pleasurable and something that inspires us sexually. That's a different meaning than I'm kind of going and looking for a way to get away from the meanings that are alive in our sexual relationship because I can't handle it. And I'm going and looking for a way to get away from that to stop growth rather than how do we keep growing as a couple. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, that makes sense. So I, this is kind of a big question. We probably can't go too deep into it, but how do you rebuild trust after something like that? Or worse than even the infidelity issue, how do you rebuild trust in the bedroom? By becoming more trustworthy partners. <laughs> I mean, I know that sounds really obvious, yes. but I, that's really it. Because when trust is broken down, usually it's broken down because it's, it's the exposure of untrustworthy behavior. Mm -hmm. And sometimes it's just one person who's acted untrustworthy. Sometimes it's two people, even if there's one that's sort of committed the most overt act. Sure. Right. So a lot of times people can be kind of indecent in their partnerships, even if there's only one who has the most explicit version of it because they've had an affair or, or you know, in some way broken contract. So I think that um, what these often are is crises, but they are potentially productive crises because they, the couple is so disorganized by the exposure of an infidelity, right. for example, that they can then take a look at who are we? How did we get here? And, and that's not to say that, oh, the person that was cheated on is complicit and part of the cheating. I'm definitely not saying that. But how, what, what does this expose about who we are as a couple and who you are as a person and who I am as a person? Mm -hmm. And what do I want to take from this and do with it? And sometimes I have people that are so focused on trusting their spouse partly because they don't want to deal with how untrustworthy their spouse is and continues to be. Like, it's almost like I want to trust you so I can kind of go back to sleep mm. rather than really dealing with how much you aren't a trustworthy person who's not really going to self-confront and really change things. Or people can do it another way, which is 
you've actually grown up and confronted it and I would rather just hang you from a high branch and whip you constantly <laughs> because then I can get away from my own sense that I had something to do with it yeah. right or that it's an invalidation of me that you were unfaithful and I want the moral high ground sure. rather than dealing with the part of me that feels like I behaved in an unchoosable way the, the part of me that can imagine why you might have been drawn to somebody else. And I, again, I'm not saying, you know, somebody is responsible for their spouse's bad behavior ever, right. but you may be responsible for the context in which that choice started to make sense to somebody, even if it was indulgent and wrong. Mm -hmm. And so a lot of times we don't want to deal with our role in an unhappy marriage. We'd rather just cry victim and persecute the other person so it's an opportunity to grow up and become more trustworthy people and to more honestly assess the trustworthiness. I mean, I think when you really know your spouse has changed and dealt with something, you feel it. And maybe you're afraid to feel it because maybe then you have to grow up too. But, you know, you can feel that something is qualitatively different. Mm -hmm. And But that's what it requires to build trust again, is to become better people. Yeah. Deep work and not avoid yeah. the work. Right. Exactly. Exactly. And that's just what marriage and relationships will do to us if we let it. I mean, we can resent it and be angry that it doesn't fit some artificial fake ideal that, you know, that the that most people out there are having the easy life. I've not met them. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, but for the rest of us, it's like, you know, rolling up your sleeves and growing up and facing yep. yourself and becoming a better person. And that's how you have good relationships is you become somebody that's easy to be close to. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that makes sense. So now if, if you were going to give advice just real quickly, because we're going to yeah. end up here, but um, teaching your kids about sex, mm -hmm. would that be the big thrust of what you'd share or what's what do our listeners need? To well, know you know, I do my, this whole course on this where, where I'm kind of helping parents think about kids at every age from birth up to adulthood. You know, there, there is a there is a way to be in this conversation appropriate to their developmental needs. Um, but I think the basic idea is that sexuality has the potential to be a wonderful part of being human. It also has the potential to be a really damaging part, be a way of being human, depending on yeah. what you do with it, right? And, you know, of course, you want to talk to your kids about the possibility of being exploited and, and protect them in that sense. But helping them think about how they're in relationship to others through their sexuality and how they're in relationship to themselves through their sexuality and that the importance of it being a function of respect and sort of intimate self expression and helping them think about how they create that in their lives through the choices that they make. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you know, basically what you do with your sexuality says a lot about who you are, both in how you relate to yourself and how you relate to others. And so, you want to be really deliberate and thoughtful if you want to create a trustworthy relationship, if you want to create a meaningful, loving relationship, who you are and how you relate to yourself and others, sexually and otherwise, is everything. You can't fake it. You know, you can't fake it. And so you want to help your kids develop into people capable of good relationships. And a lot of that's by how you relate to them and how you relate to your sexuality. Yeah. Oh. Thank you so much. So much wisdom and Thank just you. so much that people are going to walk away with understanding more about their own relationship and their own understanding so that they can be better parents as well. Yeah. That's fantastic. So I know that you have a coupon code yes. that you're offering. Yep. So yeah. it's for 20% off of any of the online courses you can get on there and um, take a look. There's explanations of what they are. I've tailored it to an LDS audience, but it's really for anybody religious and otherwise, because they're just core principles. It's a lot like I'm talking today, yeah. basically, and how to improve your sexual relationship, how to develop your sexuality, and uh, how to help your kids develop theirs. So, yeah. yeah. That's perfect. Well, I happen to think that uh, good science reflects God's glory. So that yeah. makes sense. <laughs> that <Yes>. makes sense. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, That's exactly. Right. Well, thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate it. It's my pleasure being here. Thanks for having me.